to be enthusiastic about what you, you are doing. It's the most important. It was mostly about uh, setting courses on the old maps and trying to visualize the terrains. So I think very early, I was not even uh, 10 years old, I wanted to become a world champion. I think not everyone can uh, stand um, 800 hours or 900 hours of training without uh, breaking down. When you compete at world championships, you need the self-confidence. Hi, it's Tom, and today I want to invite you for an amazing interview with Thierry Jojo, who I've been talking to earlier this week, and it has been an amazing chat, amazing interview. Um, Thierry had also a lot to share, and we could have been sitting there and talking for hours, really. So if not for the time frame we've set up for ourselves, this would definitely not end in, in the two hours that we've spent together. Um, so. Um, a big part of this you're going to see today in this video. But before I go uh, and let you into the interview itself, I want to also uh, mention three things. One apology and two announcements, really. So an apology, unfortunately, I haven't noticed some of the questions that you've posted for Thierry on the Instagram role that I had. And I didn't ask those questions, so I apologize for that. It, was, it wasn't intentional. I just noticed it yesterday. And yeah, even though we were going through all the questions from the community, because I thought this would be a good way to handle this interview, unfortunately, some of them, I just haven't realized they are there and I didn't ask them. So I apologize. Uh, one of the announcements is that um, before the part that you will see today uh, in this video, I've been talking with Thierry about several different interesting also things. Among those, we were talking about his training camp in Tenerife with the Finnish team. And uh, I want to mention that if some of you are planning to go to Tenerife, uh, then there is a, a, a bunch of maps, newly made maps. Uh, most of them are sprint maps, but some of them are also amazing forest maps that you can purchase and then run on while in Tenerife. So I'm definitely going to use that because I'm going to Tenerife in March for one week. Um, but if some of you would also be going and you would be looking for a good source for, of, of orienteering materials, then I'll be posting a link to the web page in the description. Uh, good quality maps and I totally recommend purchasing them and having some orienteering fun if you will be going to this uh, Spanish island or maybe you will plan to go there because there are some amazing maps over there. And the second announcement, probably the most important out of, to, out of everything I have today, is that um, we are going to, going to also launch a Patreon page so that you get a chance to support the growth and uh, the continuity of this channel. Uh, the way the Patreon works, for those of you that don't know, is that you can pledge a certain amount of money that will be um, transferred to us from your, I think, credit card every month. So it's like a steady income for, for me and I guess for Mati as well, uh, who is uh, doing the post editing of the videos, um, so that uh, we uh, like have some motivation to continue growing this channel and continue, continue delivering the uh, content that we are doing over here. So um, if you feel that this has been quite an interesting journey. I want to see, you want to see how it develops, then uh, this is a good way to support us. There will be several tiers over there that you can join. Um, some of them will also give you additional benefits like access, for example, to non-published materials from the interviews that we are having. So for example, from the chat, this week that I had with Thierry, some of the materials will only be, will, will only be available to the Patreon supporters. Uh, and I think it's worth um, seeing those. Uh, also, I'm also planning to let some of you actually access the chats I'm going to have with different people so that you get the chance to ask some questions live as we go through our discussion or just participate in, uh, the, in the chat, in the interview, uh, live as it's being recorded on the Zoom platform. So if this sounds interesting, we'll be absolutely grateful for all the support that we can get over here. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Thierry Jojo. Hello, everybody. Today we are talking with Thierry Jojo, a legend from the orienteering world. My name is Tom. This is Into the Forest I Go, a channel about orienteering, running with the map and compass. If you want to learn more about this, then stay with us until the end of the video or just explore other videos on the channel. And with this, we are going to kick this chat uh, with Thierry Jojo off. And um, today we um, 
meeting for the first time, hopefully not the last time, and we are going to be going mainly through the questions that came through all the viewers of the channel, because this is done for you. So I feel like if you had questions, and uh, there are a lot of them, if I won't have an opportunity to ask them, I will let you down. So that's why I wanted to start with everything that we got from the users, and then um, we will just carry on with anything that's left, although we also have a time limit. So let's see how it goes. Welcome, Thierry. Thank you. Very nice to be with you. I have been looking uh, all the video you have been uh, publishing, and I think it's uh, very nice to have people like you who try to spread a little bit um, uh, some good stuff uh, around orienting. It's uh, quite little um, available online, so <clears throat> it's uh, it's very nice to be online with you today. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's one of the goals of the channel to spread some orienteering professional knowledge, really. That's what I'm aiming at. And I think we are getting there slowly. All right. So uh, I didn't write who the questions are from, but that doesn't really matter. And uh, they are not ordered in any, in any particular order. So I'll just start with the first one. How much time did you spend on map analysis and other similar off-running uh, or, or off gym activities when you were uh, still a professional runner. So I'm, I'm usually advocating that this is a huge part of the training and you should do it a lot if you want to aim for the highest success in orienteering. Uh, but one of the um, viewers asked how much time did you spend on it? It's... Um... It's hard to, to give a number, but of course I was spending uh, quite much time uh, preparing for big competition. So it means uh, looking at the old map, setting courses, doing a lot of uh, visualization has always been a very important part of my process. I think um, uh, the months before World Championships, I was always uh, starting my day with a morning run, with a map with the course of the, um, on the map of the embargo area. So just to create mental picture. So this part was a very important part of the process. Of course, um, trying to collect as much information as possible before the competition. So you, you know, it's, uh, it's a big, uh, mental game. What we are doing, like, uh, yes. you just get one chance. You just, uh, visit for the first time the competition terrains but you need to build up this kind of feeling like it's not the first time you will do this so it's uh i have always seen this as um as a pre all the preparation to feel like it's just doing it uh, one more time so i was uh, investing a lot of time in the mental preparation so for me basically it was just running with a map and trying to build up uh, scenarios or like uh, trying to visualize the terrains. And um, then it was bringing me a lot of uh, confidence and also make me feel very relaxed before the competition because I felt okay, but I have done this like uh, 100 times uh, in my mind. So it's just a continuity of it. And, uh, but uh, to give a number, of course, uh, when I was injured or I was playing some catching features, this kind of stuff, uh, look, looking quite much uh, GPS tracking, but um, it was mostly about uh, setting courses on the old maps and trying to visualize the terrains, trying to play my uh, World Championships race in my mind. So this, it was w what I was doing. So I can give a number but of course i was full-time professional so i was thinking about my work race uh, every hour uh, during the day cool awesome uh you, you touched a very interesting topic i have a question about it from my side so maybe we'll get to it later maybe the, uh, another time but i think visualization is super interesting i really believe in it uh, i've seen some interesting <clears throat> studies regarding the visualization and i know how powerful it is and i also know that lots of runners are not doing it at all and I remember one of your um, interviews, I think it was on, on World of O, uh, where you said exactly what you repeated today, that when you got your first uh, medal that you were aiming for, you felt like it was just another time after 100 uh, previous races in the same terrain and 100 um, championships that you've won previously. And that's a really powerful part of the visualization. So I would maybe like to get into this um, maybe later, maybe next time, 
about the process of how you're doing the visualization, what's important in it. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize that this is like an, an important part of what you said. Um, okay, the second one is, who is the goat? <laughs> All right, so I can see you smiling, which means you know what goat is, do you? <laughs> of course I know. Okay. No, so but this, I think it's... Um... <laughs> It's um, it's not that important. Of course, when I was doing my elite career, I wanted to to be the absolute uh, best in some stuff. Uh, I think I have been like if uh, I think uh, people will get troubles to get more gold medals than me in uh, middle distance, especially if uh, walk uh, continues like this with every second year of forest walk. So this, of course, it makes me very happy and proud in a way, especially this long journey starting from France to to be you no know, coach of a top national team. I think when I look this, of course, I'm very proud, but I find it very unfair to compare people. Me, when I was young, I had uh, big idols like uh, Oi Vinton, Peter Torresen, Jürgen Mortensen, and, um, and I think those... Uh, we are crazy uh, orientals. I got a lot of inspiration. Uh, I can see I have inspired a lot of people as well. So this I'm uh, proud of it. But then it's uh, it's quite tough because if uh, you look, of course, uh, Simon Nigli, Tove Alexanderson, they have more gold medals than me. So I have a lot of respect for this. But uh, it's not that important. One day there will be a male runner who will get more than uh, 40, 14 time, uh, fourteen uh, gold medal at World Championships. I think uh, this will happen one day. And uh, but for me, it's not that important. I have done my uh, journey. I'm uh, very happy of what I have done. I feel uh, super lucky because uh, now I got the chance to to get uh, the job I have, I get the chance uh, to inspire people. So this, it makes me super proud. And um, it's, um, so of course, uh, it's hard to compare people, but for me, uh, still, uh, I think uh, there is only one orienter I would have liked to compete at my best. It was Peter Torresen, because uh, he was ending his career when I was starting mine. But uh, and then he became coach of the French team, and it's a guy I will really have enjoyed to compete against mm -hmm. because I think um, we were very competitive, both of uh, us, and uh, I will have really enjoyed to compete against uh, my idol when I was fully ready and he was at his best. So yeah. sadly, it was a uh, 10 years difference, but otherwise. Uh, um, I really enjoy uh, today's uh, top orienters. I uh, try to learn from them to see how they are doing the stuff. And uh, but uh, the goat, yeah, yeah. I, I hope I uh, I'm in the list. But um, if you take uh, some other people, uh, if you take a ten years old uh, kid, he don't know my name probably. Oh, and, uh, I I actually know many kids who know your name. Okay. Uh, so, so I think you're still on the list, uh, but yeah. I absolutely. But uh, I will soon disappear from the list, and uh, when uh, I... <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's possible you you will be somewhere in in the archives. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, the younger the people get, and the older you get, the, of course, there will be new new ones that are in the top. So yeah, that's absolutely the answer that I expected. Uh, I mean, it's hard to pick someone who is the, the greatest of all time, uh, because there is no clear criteria, right? Mm -hmm. Which uh, which you can measure it with. And there are absolutely a lot of amazing Corinthians out there. Uh, the ones that you've mentioned, of course, I would add uh, just from the top of my head very quickly, Daniel Hubman to the list as well. I mean, he's uh, he, he's the great champion and an inspiration to many people as well. Um, uh, all right. Uh, actually, a funny story about this. So uh, I've been doing a, a video with Noel Brown. He's the uh, Jaywalk participant uh, not so long ago. And, and when it got published, People started writing in the comments under the video, uh, goat, goat, absolute goat, and, and, and posting a picture actually of a goat. 
and, and I didn't know what goat meant at the time. And I was like, what the hell is going on? I even asked the comments, but nobody answered me. And then there was football uh, World Cup and people were talking about Messi as goat. And I finally Googled it. <laughs> and then I learned what actually the goat stands for. I didn't know it earlier. All right. Anyway, um, the next one I have is what were your short, mid, and long-term goals in your career? And I, I, I'm, quite, I, I quite, I'm quite sure that you probably have different goals at the beginning and at the end of your career. Uh, so you can pick a period or you can just go through all of this. Mm, it's, um, I think, very early because I was lucky. Uh, I was traveling quite a lot with my uh, parents and we were spectating uh, world championships. I think the first time I was spectating a world championship was in France in um, 87. So I was eight years old. So of course, it's uh, when you see um, a world championship uh, and like this happening in France. So it was in uh, 87 in Gérard You start to dream quite big. For me, it has well always been quite important, like uh, this uh, dream part and um, building up a positive picture. So I think very early, I was not even uh, 10 years old, I wanted to become a world champion. But it was quite naive uh, because it was I was living in France quite a long. Um, it was uh, quite a long process. So but still, I had this ultimate goal. To, to be a world champion like uh, Ken Tolson, uh, the idol I had at that time, a Swede who won in um, France in um, 87. So I had this uh, long term goal. And of course, it was not a straight line. So I, I would say up to 17, 18 years old. I was uh, still quite sure I could make it because every time I was uh, among the best in my uh, class. But then it was um, quite challenging because like uh, G-Walk, I had some up and downs result, sometimes uh, good, sometimes bad. Mm -hmm. I was ending with some medals, but I was um, not a junior world champion. So I end up with uh, two silvers and two bronze. So when I step into the senior class, the first two years were, were quite challenging because it felt like that goal was uh, too far away and uh, I will not reach it. The, I was uh, believing like uh, they were too good for me, the top uh, ones. And I will say like maybe... This part of the process was very important because like I shift a little bit from being a world champion to really do the work. So, and this, those years were very powerful. Like uh, I was 21, between 21 and 23. Then I uh, really work on the roots of uh, my technique, my physics, and also the mental part. I invest a lot of time to see how I could become better. And I would say I forgot a little bit this uh, result um, focus. So I was very much focused on uh, making the best of uh, my day, like really making a micro process. And this become uh, crazy powerful because like I was really like trying to optimize everything. And my level really rise up day by day. So it was... Uh, uh, maybe a surprise for those not seeing me uh, trainings, but for those who were training with me, I think they could see it like really like uh, the development when I was um, 21, 23, it was we were really pushing each other at trainings. We had this training group in um, in France with really top orienters. And <clears throat> I really feel like the, the gap was closing to the very best. Mm -hmm. But um, mostly because I was just in my bubble and focusing on um, what I could control. And this was very, very powerful. So I would say like um, it's very important, like short term goal. It's like to make uh, the best of your day. Is this day like you have in front of you is making you better or not? It, I think it's a question every top elite orienters uh, need to answer at some point. Is like what you are doing today, is it making you better? Right. Uh, short term and long term. 
And I think when you have this kind of attitude, where you feel like, I mean, at the time I was uh, not a professional orienter, so I was still a student. And I think um, being a professional orienter is more uh, attitude, like what you are doing in your daily life to be uh, the absolute uh, best version of yourself. And I think I had this period. It means like I was investing uh, so much time in getting the knowledge or so reading a lot of stuff, uh, trying to learn, traveling and uh, this kind of stuff. And uh, of course, you learn some stuff, both, both in uh, food, uh, trainings and um, and um, personal uh, development. And I think uh, all those uh, phases were quite important. Yeah, so I, I love the part when you're saying that the short-term goal should be the, uh, like do your best every day because it nicely fits into this method of tiny increments every day, like be 1% better every day. And with time, with you know 365 days in a year, you will grow so much, right? And in general, you will be so much better than one year before. And it definitely works. So I, I love it. Um, all right, thank you. Let's go to the next one. Um, do you think about coming back to professional running? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the more time is passing, the harder it's uh, going to be. No, but... Uh, but you so... know, in in master's classes? I, I'm not ah, saying yeah. elite. No, 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 no. I'm, um, I think it was a different process in uh, my life. Like, uh, I was very happy to go as far as possible. So it means uh, my... Uh, I was ending my elite career, I was 38 years old, so in 2017 in Estonia. So this, it was, um, it felt uh, very important to end uh, at the, the top, because uh, I mean, I had no um, frustration. I felt I really ended uh, clean the way I wanted to, to end. So this made the process a little bit easier. But of course, like, uh, if you ask me, so no, since uh, 2017, I have been um, coaching uh, on national team level. But the joy you get from this life and this kind of stuff, it's no comparison. So, of course, uh, I regret uh, every day the life I had as a runner. I mean, this kind of freedom was uh, just crazy, like to be able to travel, do whatever I wanted. Of course, I was... Um, I had to perform at World Championships and uh, I was putting uh, myself under a lot of uh, expectation. So it's a, I will not say it was an easy ride, but uh, I mean, I really enjoy it, especially the last year of my elite career. I mean, being one more time world champion or not was not going to change my life. So it was pure joy. A lot of trips uh, with uh, good friends and uh, enjoyable yeah. uh, camps all around. So it was a dream life. And of course, um, those last year, I have missed uh, those days quite much. So, and uh, also the freedom of uh, being perfectly trained and prepared, like when you, you were racing, I think it was quite enjoyable uh, feelings to feel everything was under control. You were feeling strong. So this, of course, I miss it. And uh, but uh, I'm still happy of the life I'm having today. I think it's a, it's a very exciting job uh, as well to be a coach. But of course, if I could choose, I will be back uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> probably everybody would <laughs> to be like 10 years younger and be able to repeat stuff again that we were doing when we were younger. It's always awesome. Uh, but I, I'm happy that uh, you're also enjoying the life of uh, of the coach. I think it's it's a lot of joy as well uh, to inspire people and help them uh, get better and uh, be happy with their results. Um, yeah, I, I, it gives me a lot of fun as well. Uh, all right, uh, let me have a look. Oh, this one I love. It, it, I love it because I always have problems with it. So someone is asking, what did you do to prevent injuries? So... Um, I, I actually don't remember. I have been following your career um, uh, and I don't remember. Did you have any uh, world orienteering champs where you couldn't run because you were injured? I, I think something like this happened, but I don't remember when. No, I, it's, uh, I mean, um, 
I have been a full-time uh, professional since uh, 2004 to 2017, so quite many years. Yeah. And then I was uh, training quite much, so I was training uh, around 800 uh, hours per year, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. During my elite career, I got um, three stress fractures. So a little bit of uh, overuse and uh, because I was uh, running quite a lot. It mm -hmm. was uh, quite many hours of runnings. And um, so I would say from what I see as a coach and uh, three stress fracture, it was not uh, much. I mean, uh, every time it was uh, stopping me during two months. And it was uh, sometimes it's better to have this kind of uh, problems than uh, some uh, more challenging ones. So I, yes. I felt like I've been quite lucky. Lucky or I think there is a part of genetic. I, I think not everyone can uh, stand um, 800 hours or 900 hours of training without uh, breaking down. So I think so too, yeah. The process, I think... We don't have all the same body, but also what I was doing and which was quite important is like, I think a typical mistake is like people start doing uh, alternative trainings when they, they are injured. And I mean, it's too late. Like, uh, of course, you you don't solve uh, the problem, you, you fix it. But uh, it means like, it's very important to integrate alternative trainings as part of the training uh, on daily, not daily routines, but weekly routines. So it means like, even if I was hating it, uh, I did a lot of uh, aqua running, even when I was uh, totally fit uh, to run. So hmm. I tried during my week to have some biking, some water running, some uh, swimming. So just to make sure like I was not uh, only running, so it was, um, but of course, uh, when you try to be the best version of yourself, you need to push yourself, you need to challenge yourself. So you're on the edge all the time. It's not by doing uh, the things um, halfway that you will get the uh, top result. So you, you're on the edge all the time. And we see it with uh, all the top runners. Uh, so I would say I have... It's very seldom I have been at uh, at World Championships. Uh, totally fine. I always had a small issue. I think everyone has a small issue. So I would say maybe 50% of my World Championships, it had been some small troubles, but it's more how you handle those troubles. You make uh, because like uh, you push your body to the limits. So it's um, it's tough. But you need to, to have some kind of a plan. So this is uh, still undelable. And me, I have been quite lucky. I have not uh, skipped a single world championship. The only year I had big troubles was 2012. I got a stress fracture uh, two months before world championship. So the preparation. Yeah. Was, uh, so I was back into running one week before world championship. So it was a little bit uh, too little. I was uh, fourth uh, this year in middle distance. But then the preparation, uh, I tend to to say it was my best world championships ever because like the motivation I had, uh, I was doing three water running uh, trainings per day in the last two months, during uh, two months. I, so the preparation was crazy. And uh, I'm still, uh, even though it was not a medal, I was uh, very proud, um, maybe not the D-Day, but uh, some weeks after and things like this, I was very proud. I could uh, prepare for this uh, championship uh, this way. I was really trying to maximize my chances. And um, it was tough, but it was a fun experience to prepare a world championships a uh, bit in a different way. So, um, yeah, it's really like one advice uh, I give to all the youngsters and things like this. Don't wait to be injured to to think about the running load and how you integrate alternative trainings. It's uh, if you wait uh, to be injured to put in uh, alternative trainings in your routines, 
then uh, it won't work in uh, long term because uh, you will be on the edge all the time and uh, so you need to to find a good balance and uh, it's very important to to have some days where you are on bike or on water running and so the body can uh, have time to to reload a little bit yeah. Yeah. Okay. So exactly as I expected, there is no magic pill. You just have to do your core training and be consistent with it and make sure that it's like weaved in into your routine, training routine. And then it's going to be, uh, at, well, it's, it may be better, but it's of course no guarantee. As you said, genetics definitely play a role. A funny thing is that uh, my brother and I, uh, we are, we've, been, we've both been doing orienteering since we were little. And I always had problems with injuries and he almost never has any injuries, even though he's training a lot harder than me because he can. Uh, so even if you have the same parents, sometimes it doesn't even work the same way. Let me look at the list. Next one is what would you do better as a junior? What should uh, these young people focus on? Um, uh, like, uh, so I, I guess that, the, the second part is actually mine. So what should these young people focus on? But the first part is what, what would you do better as the junior comes from one of the juniors? Uh, so if you remember your junior years and you've already mentioned that you haven't been the top one, at least at uh, J-Walks, um, what, what do you think uh, you were missing during that time? I think it's um, a lot to say, like what you should focus as a junior, it's... Um... It's very important uh, years for your elite carriers because like um, G-Walk result is not the ultimate uh, goal. I mean, the day you step into the senior class, it means zero. It just gives you um, a feedback where you stand at the moment. Yes. But then it's uh, the opening of uh, hopefully a very long career where a lot will happen with a lot of ups and downs and you are an unfinished uh, product. So you really need to think what you need to do now to get even better five, ten years later. So it's um, sometimes uh, I think juniors, they um, look a little bit for shortcuts to get the best possible result at g -Walk. But me, I got very happy. I just got a silver and a bronze medal at g -Walk because I was still very hungry. And um, the day I stepped into senior class, I still had this uh, long-term uh, goal. And uh, so um, it felt quite important. But I would say... It's one of my uh, philosophy. I think like when you compete at world championships, you need the self-confidence. This is uh, for me something very important. Maybe we'll discuss about it uh, now or in the future, but it's all about, uh, of course, it's about training. So you need to be strong physically and technically, but I mean, the self-confidence is everything when you stand uh, one minute before the race of your year at work. Of course, it's a lot of happening in this last minute and you need to believe you are able to, to perform that day and um, a normal race will be good enough to get a result. So a lot about uh, self-confidence. And if I see my elite career, I had a lot of uh, confidence mostly because I could rely very much on my uh, orienteering technique. It's why I was uh, investing so much time into orienteering. Um, because then it becomes very hard to make a mistake. Like, uh, I, I had so much trust in my technique. I was practicing almost, uh, every day with, a uh, with a map. So it means like, uh, my technique was, uh, very reliable in every type of terrains. And so, and this was bringing me so much confidence because the uh, morning of the world championships, I knew it will be very hard to make a mistake. So, uh, I mean, this kind of confidence bring you all the way to the start and during the race, if you do the same stuff as... Uh... So I was really seeing competing as a continuity of my trainings. And of course, if I was a junior head coach um, at the moment, it's something I will uh, in phase a lot, like uh, invest in trainings, uh, 
put some hours uh, in forest with the maps because it, those years they are so important. It's like if you enter the senior classes with some weaknesses, of course you will have time to to work on it at some point and things like this. But the, um, the number of technical um, hours or technical trainings you have as a junior they are really important for the senior class because it's where you shape up yourself. You need to understand the contours. You need to know how you use your compass. And if you step in the senior class with uh, big weaknesses with your technique, it will be um, challenging because, like, um, of course, they run a little bit faster in the senior class and uh, you have nowhere to hide very much. So if on top of that, you make mistakes, technically, then uh, those uh, yeah. are very important. So I would say... Uh, as a junior, your main focus is to to put some hours in uh, technical work. Like uh, for me, it has always been um, a lot of hours as a junior, and uh, it was not so important. Like I was, uh, I was as a junior just uh, training uh, 400, 450 hours, but that means fifty percent were um, orienting technique. So it means uh, quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, I I love this because. Um, my philosophy as, as a coach as well is, for example, when we're doing the training camps, we are not go doing any pure running sessions. If, if we're going running, it's a forest race, it's a sprint race, right? It, it's definitely with the map. And that's because I believe that first you need to get your orienteering technique to the highest possible level, and then you can worry about your physical preparation. And uh, I, think, I think I've been inspired to uh, believe in this, partly by you, because when I was following your career, it, it was always amazing to me how good technically you were. Uh, but I also absolutely agree, and this is exactly my way of thinking as well with what you said, that when you're, um, uh, when you, when you're approaching the race and you want to have this confidence, it's, and you get to choose one, and uh, the options are be confident in your orienteering technique and be confident in your running speed, I, uh, you should always take the first one. Because the first one is, if you're not confident in this area, it's a much bigger variable. So the, the, the spread of mistakes that can happen because of imperfect or interior technique, it's much bigger than the spread of time difference when you're having a, a worse day because of, of your physical preparation. Yeah, of course, uh, you are right. But I would say it's... Um... It's very nice to, when you are young seniors, to have at least one strength. And if it's a physical part, it will help as well. Because like, uh, if you are the strongest physically, it will bring some uh, confidence. So for, for me, it was not my uh, strength. My strength was the technique. But just as you say, like, you see like a season is a continuity of races. You have those races in spring. Now we, in uh, February, the runners will start to compete a little bit in Spain, in, in Portugal. And of course, all those competitions, they, they are not uh, world championships. So they are not that important, but every race will bring some confidence for for world championships and for me it was um, quite important to perform already quite well in february because i could feel like it was give me giving me a lot of peace in the process yes. and i think when you have a good uh, technique you know like you won't do a five minute mistake on first control exactly of course, it helps a little bit at warm up when you start to warm up and to enter the race. Like you have this self confidence. So for me, it's it's why the technique is m so important. It's because it's bringing uh, some calmness and um, some uh, relaxing uh, feelings before the start. And also. Well, okay. <laughs> we could probably talk about this for a long time. I'm just going to get to the next question <laughs> because there are still quite a lot of, left, of them left. Uh, so the next one is, have you been doing any special training sessions to train your visual memory and eye quickness? Uh, did you run normal running sessions, for example, with the map? I, I'm sure you did because I read it in one of the articles. Of course, it's... Um... It's a lot of ways to develop this, and I think the more maps you look, 
the better you get at uh, extracting the feature and also your map reading technique is quite important do you use one uh, one hand two two hands so to stabilize the map so you can get more information so for me it's the most important is to we we'll come back to this um, hours of uh, orienting technique is to find your style to spend time it's me i believe like the more hours you will put into work usually the more result you will uh, you will get so of course i was um, doing a lot of uh, pure running uh, with maps like doing some kind of simulation or we have talked about this visualization so i was doing quite a lot of the, of it so it becomes uh, very easy to extract extract uh, feature from the map at different scale, one to fifteen thousand. Of course, it's a different practice. You need to practice a little bit. At the end of my career, I was using quite much this uh, magnifying glass. Yeah, so to to get more um, more flow in my uh, navigation in long distance. So I think it's just uh, practicing a lot with a map, but uh, it won't come by itself. So it's um, it's like uh, putting hours of work and uh, doing this. But I did, of course, a lot of uh, intervals trainings with maps, both uh, the first five, 10 seconds after you stop the interval so um, to, to read some stuff. So um, a lot of stuff also when I was doing uh, water running, I was doing a lot of uh, it with uh, maps uh, in the pool so it's everything goes together so i felt like uh, for me it was very important to to try to it's not because you are not on the terrain at the moment that you can't uh, create mental picture and this kind of stuff and also to see how you you will read the map, I think we all see it. Huh? It's when you change compass or the first uh, trainings, you 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 feel like uh, everything is different, and uh, so it shows quite well how important are the part of the routines and uh, your habits. So I feel like um, if you don't put those hours of practice, it's hard to become a master. Yeah. And uh, when you were doing those training sessions with the map, can you give like uh, an example of what you were doing with the map specifically? So were you, for example, picking route choices or what was it? Well, if, I have tried uh, many different things during my um, elite career. When I was uh, juniors, I was doing different type of exercise. So it can be, it could be some exercise uh, memorizing uh, stuff like uh, for example in one map you had a line so you try to run mentally this line and then at the end of the next intervals you were getting another map with some controls and then you try to to see if the what you had in mind was passing through those controls so i think it's quite um there are a lot of uh, different um, type of um, trainings you can do, I think. Um, but at the end of my elite career, I realized the most, maybe also because I had uh, developed these abilities to create a mental picture and things like this, I was uh, doing it very simple, a course on uh, the map. That was it. And then I was seeing myself, I think I, I become very good at uh, creating mental picture of the terrains. So um, just running the course uh, mentally. So it means like uh, I was, and then I had been in so many different type of terrains in so many different um, race situations that basically I was going out of uh, the home. I had my map. And then the first five first minutes, I was not looking at the map so much. I was thinking, okay, now you are at the warm up of uh, World Championships. So what do you think? Like today it's a good day. Like yeah, no, physically I'm not uh, feeling good. Okay, and then you can see a little bit your competitor. So everything in your mind, like you you play a movie and um, again the visualization, bit. right? Yeah, and like trying to. 
put what you are working in practice. So it means like you you see yourself doing your last uh, past ones and you try to to repeat a little bit what you want to have at World Championships. So it's different. Uh, it can be different stuff. Huh? So last, for example, the last World Championships I had, I knew the emotional part will be quite important. So I try to repeat myself like, okay, how you want to end up? You want to be proud of yourself to have deal with this kind of uh, emotional load. Like you, you feel like you are strong. And so you try to reinforce all the process. And I think it's not something you can start the day before the race. It's no, uh, no. It's, uh, it's a long process. And then... Then you start to look at your map and then you, you imagine you're in the start box, still doing this by uh, running. It can be this speed uh, run. And then you, you look the map, try to extract the feature. And I mean, at some point, um, uh, a map uh, is almost becoming like a book. Yeah? It's like a story coming up, like uh, the features, they are jumping to your eyes yeah you see like okay i want to see this 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 it will be and i think i could really see a difference during my elite career like the more experience i was getting then it was a um, flow of information a map like you could really see uh, because you had been so many times in those kind of situation like when you were seeing, like for example, a flat part just before attacking the controls and things like this, you knew exactly, like, okay, at this point, I need to really, it's where, like, I need to be super precise. It's, and then you see a little bit, like, it's what um, I was calling the matrix <laughs> at some point. It's like you feel like, you really have a good picture when you are in a good mood and fresh and uh, well prepared you you really get this flow of information where it will be very important to to be at uh, 100 percent of uh, focus and this kind of things where you can make big mistakes and this it was uh, at the end of my elite career it was really crazy how much just the training from the door like this with a map could bring to the process because you were looking the map you of course you you still could uh, could be wrong at some place and it was important to have relevant uh, training camps and this kind of stuff to keep collecting more and more information but um nowadays even as a coach when you set a course and things like this you can really see like um okay this uh, they will struggle at this point because like this they need to be accurate and they can do the risk of mistake is uh, three times more than uh, 50 meters before so it's this kind of and of course if you have this kind of uh, feelings and knowledge as owners um it's um you can perform quite uh, at a quite uh, high level because you you have understand everything about um what's um what's um, elite navigation and this kind of the risk level where you need to to put your focus during a race and um, this i think you can practice it a lot even without being uh, on spot here yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the two things for example i mean uh, there are as you say many ways of doing this uh, but the two ones that we did recently for example in our club is uh, one you go for to the running training with the map that, that has a course and your goal is to uh, run through the course. It has like, let's say, 15 controls. Um, as you said, visualize, uh, not just uh, which, which route you will take, but actually visualize how you're running through different feature ter uh, terrain features. Uh, so th remember that you're crossing the hill, that you're crossing the marsh, that you're going on the left side of the bushes and so on, right? So try to visualize the course uh, together with picking route choices. And then uh, at the end of the training, you get a blank map again with no course on it. And you have to like redraw the course with the root choices. So this is like kind of the memory um, exercise. Yeah, very good. Another yeah. one that I absolutely love, and we have been doing it from as, as long as I remember, 
is like uh, moving the controls from one map to another. So you have a map with controls, you have map with no controls. And you can do it on the gym, you can do it everywhere, basically. All you need is like a piece of paper and a pen uh, and two maps, of course. So um, uh, the, and the only trick to this is that um, it, you, you do it on time, so you can do it as a race against other runners. Uh, and you start all of you together, you go to the map with the control controls, remember as many controls as you can, and then you have a short track of exercises. So you can do, you know, flips, you can do some jumping jacks, you can do burpees, mm -hmm. whatever, basically. And it should take like 20 to 30 seconds so that you get a little bit tired. You, of course, have to focus a little bit on the exercises. So maybe you're forgetting a little bit about the controls that you try to remember. But then you get to the blank map and you draw the controls that you still remember. Then go to uh, the map with the controls and repeat the process until either the time is out or all the controls have been already moved and you're confident that everything is done. So this is, again, I think a very simple but fun exercise that helps you train your visual memory. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Absolutely. it's not really visualization, but when it comes to visual memory, so that you don't have to spend so much time looking at the map during your race, but actually look, uh, remember the things, and you can focus on the features in front of you, uh, which I know you're also uh, advocate to as much look around um, um, and you know spend time with uh, with the map as as little as is needed. Uh, then I think it's it's really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Is there any difference between middle and long distance in terms of what skills are needed? And should you train differently for these distances? Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the user here means uh, technical training, not physical training, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, but this it's um, it's always an interesting question. Like, I think um, you can't uh, really put aside the, the physical part of this. Because I think uh, when you jump into the senior class, you tend to put the long distance as a gigantic uh, mountain. Yes. So, of course, it affects the whole process. At least for me, it was like this. And if I, there is something I maybe regret a little bit in my elite career, but it was great in uh, many other ways, it was to focus a little bit too much on the short distances at the beginning. And um, to not take seriously enough the long distance from the start. So it took some years. And I think with the hours of training, I become uh, also um, uh, stronger and stronger in long distance. But I think it's uh, very important how you approach the long distance. Like I think most of people, they um, go a little bit too defensive and for me it was like a very important step it was like to imagine a long distance as a three middle distance in a row uh -huh. when i did uh, this uh, switch of course the whole uh, the whole process was different like i was a lot more offensive i was um, the speed was different the navigation was better so i felt like you should not make a big difference in, of course, the scale is different. So you need to find a bit of a strategy to still be able to use uh, the map the same way. But I think it's mostly mentally, like uh, probably you start the long distance, also technically a little bit more defensive. There are some uh, rule choices. You need, of course, to get the experience and things like this how to pick the best routes. So this is part of the process, but I will not say uh, it's a um, completely uh, different type of navigation. I think at some point yeah. you need to be quite offensive in the terrain to get through. So for me, it was very important to... Um, the day I was starting to stop worrying about the standing the distance, then it becomes very easy because I felt like in long distance, the big difference compared to the middle distance, what I felt was like I had time to make a mistake. In middle distance, I felt, fuck, if I do one minute mistake on first control, then it will be, it, it will be hard to, to win the race. And then it, it, it brings some kind of, uh, stress. Like you, you feel you need to, mm -hmm. and in long distance, I felt 
it was so enjoyable at the end of my career because I felt physically I was prepared and also I felt I had I have time to to maybe make a two minute mistake and it's not over because like in one uh, one hour thirty or one hour forty most probably I will have time if I do well in the other part to catch up and. Uh, the stress I had before the middle distance or the long distance was completely different. Like, uh, so I feel like um, in that way, the long distance is a little bit easier to perform, at least on the elite level. If you, of course, if you are super well uh, trained, huh? yes. it's not a joke to, to run a long distance at work. You, you need to stand the distance. It's a physical challenge. But if you have put the hours and you are very well prepared, I think technically, just to make sure you you stay quite offensive, like in uh, middle distance. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So I have this one athlete I'm working with, and uh, he always says that, uh, at least on the national level, uh, he feels like he's physically a little bit better than all of the competitors. So he also has this cushion that allows him to be still confident in his performance, even if he makes one or two minutes of mistakes, because he knows he can catch up physically uh, if he keeps avoiding like bigger mistakes in, in a later part of the race. So I think it helps. I also think that in general, there aren't many big differences when it comes to orienteering techniques between middle and the long. I think the only one is really picking root choices on those long legs. And this you have to practice and you have to feel confident in your abilities to get the one uh, that will get you um, the best result. And I also love what you said about, uh, I, I never thought about it this way. So like splitting the long distance into three or two or three middle distances, probably three. Um, but uh, I also like the other part when you said that we should be, okay, we shouldn't be more defensive while running the long distance. And I, I've, I've always been like this because at least during my elite career, I've, I never was really prepared to run a long distance full speed. I knew that. So I, I was running always deliberately slower. But then when I got to the masters um, and the long races became a little bit shorter and I felt like, okay, they are within my reach suddenly. Um, in, in one of the first long distances uh, in Polish champs that, that I ran, I actually decided to push with the pace from the middle distance from the start. That was my goal before the race. and. Uh, so far, it's been the most enjoyable long race distance in my career. I really had so much fun doing running it. Yeah, no, but uh, what you are saying, it's absolutely true. It's, uh, of course, uh, we can put aside um, that you need to be prepared and it will take a little bit more time. But I mean, what I can guarantee is like most of the result is how you prepare mentally for it like how you enter the challenge and if you believe like it's going to be tough you need to be cautious you need to be careful not to open too hard then for sure it won't go well i mean if you take the world cup um, race in davos last uh, fall and it will be same this summer at world championships you go in counting before the race you can see the faces and things like this. You can see some people, they, they prepare to enjoy the challenge and people, they can go home uh, before the start because yes. they are already beaten. And I mean, <laughs> it's it's always like this. They are, um, most of people in uh, international races are beaten before the start because they, um, they don't see it as a game. Of course, it will be tough. It will be... Uh, probably not very enjoyable for some part of the race and things like this. But I mean, it's impossible to perform if you if you don't take it as a challenge and feel like, okay, yeah, let's give my uh, best try. And yep. uh, for me, it took some years before I, I got this kind of uh, feeling where, okay, yeah, for sure I will suffer, but this uh, suffering part, <laughs> is also the fun part of it and I I'm, I'm really want to be in this position and like uh, and the worst things in um, elite career is like you come to the finish and you feel you have not uh, give your all and yes. this uh, it has happened also for me in some point and things like this and and luckily after some years I felt okay well if um, if I do this I want to do it uh, fully so um, 
if I entered a race, it's to give my uh, maximum and um, have no regret. But for sure, it's so much about how you prepare for the race and for the challenge. And if you you sing defensive, when the terrain is quite tough, you will be eaten by the terrain in one second. Sure. All right, I'm going to move on. Although I could talk about this more as well. As well. Uh, what's your way of doing the post-race analysis? I remember that uh, I, I think you were getting the printout and you were noting at the printout how many seconds you lost at every control. Uh, and I also remember from one of the articles that you were very strict about it. And that's what I absolutely love as well. And I'm teaching it to to uh, to the kids. Uh, but uh, I'm wondering if uh, there was more that you were doing as a post-race analysis, uh, except from just noting how many seconds you've lost on each leg. I think it's um, it's a very important part of the process, like this. I think if uh, no, I have some distance to my elite career, and I think it's really like what makes the difference between a top elite career and the uh, average one is the quality of your analysis, mm -hmm. because like what is guaranteed is like it won't be a straight line. There is no one uh, who will dominate uh, from start to finish uh, elite career. So there are a lot of up and downs. And what I often say, it's when you are on your low, that you need this uh, those good analyses to be able to, to point out um, and to be fair to see what's missing, the part of the puzzle uh, missing, so you can develop. So this part of the analysis is uh, so important. And um, there are different stages of the analysis. Like, uh, so basically, you have some people, they already start the analysis when they are racing. So this, I don't uh, recommend it. I think like really like, uh, I mean, you, you have a race to finish and I mm -hmm. think uh, you need to, to find a way that you, even if you have been doing some mistake or you feel uh, weak physically, still you have a job to bring to the finish line. So it's, very, it's a big um, important ability to still be in the moment. Right. So put it behind you. Whatever happened, happened. Focus on what's exactly. Happening. And uh, at that present moment, you try to get the absolutely best of the situation. But once the finish line is crossed, of course, this it's very a very challenging time. I, I think you have realized it uh, yourself. It's uh, it's very different between trainings and competition because competition, when you pass the finish line, usually in big competition, you have the speakers. Mm -hmm. If we ask 100 uh, top elite orienters, we stop them at the last control. So they haven't get in touch with the speaker of the arena. Of course, they can have a feeling because they have catch up some runners, but we stop them at the last control. So they get no information about their result yet. We ask them, how was your race? The result, the answers you will get will, will be from one to 10. Yes. It's really like, because you, you have no feedback yet. So you have a feeling, but it's kind of hard to say. Sometimes me, I have been very surprised by the result compared to the feeling I had during the race, mostly due to the terrain and things like this. And once you know your result, it's very hard to be fair with the analyze. Because like once you know like it's a top race, then, okay, you forget about everything, the struggle and things like this. You, you don't judge the winners, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's why it's so challenging for a coach to talk with the runners at the finish. Because this, and it's usually the first question we get after they, they want to see the result. Because they do this as an elite sport. So part of the result is, is very important in the process. But what I want to say, it's like... You need to be fair with yourself. Like it's not because you get the top result that you have performed very well. And the opposite exactly. sometimes it means like there has been a lot of good things during the race. It doesn't show yet on the result, but you are in the process. And I feel the emotional part 
is very important to handle me i think where i was very good and i think it's something i i keep um, challenging people who are a little bit uh, uh, too quick at um, uh, leaving their disappointment uh, behind i think you can be very frustrated and it's a big source of energy of course you need to transfer it very quick into uh, analyze and uh, process but you come to the finish you are a bomb of emotion this yeah. it's a reality of quite many people and this for me I was a very bad loser and I could be very angry at myself at the finish and I will not drop this feeling right away because I, I knew it will give uh, myself a lot of energy. So I was trying to shallow it and like say, okay, why it's like this? Why uh, today it sucks and um, you are not the best? So and this, it was like, I was trying to be a little bit uh, alone in my bubble to get this uh, negative energy to have still the feeling um, of wanting to change something. So I was not like dropping the race in one second. So, but I would say like first part, very emotional. So hard to be very fair on the analyze. So basically right after the race, not so much about uh, analyze, mostly about feelings. Uh, if I was happy, I would enjoy the moment. If I was uh, sad, I will uh, stand the pain, uh, clap for the winners and take uh, as much pain as possible so I could remember this day and uh, try to change uh, some stuff uh, in the future. Yeah. And then in the evening, you try to get the reason why it has been like this. So a lot of um, today rerun, so GPS uh, comparison, split times. You need to understand why it has been like this. And I think... Again, one very important part of the process, for me at least, you if you have done a mistake, you try to replay the video in your mind of the, the leg or the beginning of the race, if it was at the beginning of the race, and you can try to see yourself acting in a different way. So you print it in your mind, you know why it was not working, and what you would have done to make it in another way. So you try, usually it was a small mental process um, in the evening. So I, I, of course, I had the map uh, print in my uh, mind already. But you try to see yourself navigating the right way. If it's possible, you, you have been back to the terrain so you can really see live what was happening. I think every time you get a chance to to go again on spot and see uh, it helps a lot to um, to understand better what was happening and then it's fine this is a problem solved of course if you have uh, evaluate uh, you need to be better at compass and things like this you will try in the coming uh, weeks and and i was also writing uh, quite a lot i had a book uh, where i was uh, collecting um, my feelings after the race so I had some kind of continuity during the season up to work. I was not uh, drawing the maps. I was also drawing by hand, having like a book for one season. And before the walk, the last two, three weeks before walk, I was looking at all those maps, trying to pick uh, just a couple of ones where um, I could uh, see some kind of um, behaving I wanted to avoid or I wanted to have during walk. And then I was traveling to work with uh, two, three maps and a bit of um, race uh, plan. So it was a uh, little bit this process, but um, very, very interesting to to spend some time. So of course, uh, it's all about the quality of the analysts who make a uh, top elite career on like if yeah. you can really like uh, find out uh, what has been missing then you will in, uh, you will improve uh, much quicker and i feel like 
it's a challenging part for quite many because like of course it's uh, not uh, fun to to see yourself in the mirror and uh, to sometimes it's easier to find uh, excuses and uh, pointing out uh, the right uh, stuff yeah yeah so I, i'm super happy that you're emphasizing how important it is uh, i have been advocating on my youtube channel that it's actually super super important um, not so long ago, we had the first meeting of the Orienteering Academy, where we are meeting with the group of people talking about preparation for the most important races during the season. And I actually started the whole series of those meetings uh, with the race analysis and explaining how it should be done properly. And, um, and, and also what you said, so visualizing yourself, how you would fix the mistake that you've made. I've, I've also um, included it as, as part of the process because I think it's so important to like not only realize what you did wrong, but actually figure out what should have been done in that uh, situation. And of course, later on, as you said, if you uh, identify some things that you lack as skills, you also need to find a way to work on it and improve it. Yeah, so in, in general, uh, amazing answer, I loved it. All right, um, uh, we still have five to go, but some of them are shorter. So let's see if we can get all of them. Um, which hand do you put your description holder on? The same one as the map and the compass or a different one? Uh, different one. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's um, uh, mostly because I, well, no, there's no particular reason. I think quite often, like um, I was using my both hands to hold the map. So it's uh, just like this. So to get a little bit more stability in the nail, so when you are attacking the control. So it was not a big issue with the um, control description. Like um, I think everything uh, works. I don't think it's that important, this one. Yeah, you, you I, I think get... so as well. I think like whatever you're used to, basically. I'm I'm, ha I'm having the whole control description on the same hand where my compass is and the map. I'm also very often reading the map where holding it in both hands. So um, that's fine. But actually something came to my mind as, as a maybe interesting thing. Uh, lately, I've been looking at my hands and I can definitely see like which hand I'm protecting myself from the bushes. And it's definitely this one. It has many scars and this one doesn't okay. have almost any of them. <laughs> so I'm <must be> like <laughs> protecting okay. myself with my left hand running to the bushes. <laughs> Um, next one is, do you have any specific rules for folding the map during the race? <clears throat> Not really. I think this, it's, um, it's something, um, you should have asked me the question, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I was starting orienteering, because I mean, it becomes such a routine after some years. Yeah. That uh, no, for me it's always very hard to answer those kind of questions because I don't even think about it anymore. So I feel like uh, um, I have a hard time to answer this question. Like I'm just uh, trying to to have the enough of the maps. I have quite a big hands, so I think I don't fold it very small. I can. Uh, and the big maps or things like this. No, it's, um, I think what's very important is like uh, to make sure more in general, like uh, in long distance or this kind of thing, you don't cover um, road choices option. So this, I think you, it's why uh, you should make uh, the map as big as possible. So you really have like the whole uh, plate in front of you. And, um, this is something uh, just by uh, practicing, you realize it a little bit, the more um, you run courses. And also, at some point, uh, I think it's something everyone, when the legs are crisscrossing and um, quite not quite often, but uh, I think a little bit like everyone, sometimes I was seeing myself i was reading the wrong uh, and uh, the wrong legs and yeah. um, and then moving on the wrong line and uh, making uh, quite big mistakes sometimes so this i realized i could uh, change it uh, quite easily and it became uh, quite a routine it was just on regular basis so it means like uh, when i was running like to check which control the number I was going. And this, I changed it in uh, 
in two weeks. Of course, I, I, I was practicing. Uh, it's also the good stuff about uh, practicing a lot of uh, orienting. It's like you get chance to, to create test. new habits quickly, uh, right? So it is, but I mean like, and then it become really a habit. And then this never happen again. It's like you are running a long leg in long distance or things like this. You have your, and just like it takes a fraction of a second to check, okay, 19. I go to 19. Yeah, it's correct. Like, and this, it was uh, fixed in uh, two, three weeks. And I never, so I think it's like you see, like you're, um, uh, you you can uh, really make some quick change very very efficient in orienting in uh, just uh, like you 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 work on it a couple of times and then it becomes a habit and it's not because you have start like to get some bad habits so you can really change it but folding the maps I think there are different uh, strategy. Of course, uh, when you you do this as an elite sport, you, you 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 don't do it like this. You do it quite uh, fast and uh, things like this. But just to make sure you don't cover some routes, you have enough uh, space. But um, no I special rules. Uh, any pro tips with this? I don't. Um, I think you just need to find what works for you. Yeah. Yeah, to be honest, I don't have any tips on this um, yeah. as well. I mean, um, I, I, I'm trying to fold my map so it doesn't flap when I'm running. And, mm -hmm. and that's basically it, right? As long as like, I can see my leg, uh, I usually also try to see the next control on the map as well. Uh, so I like, I'm not, at, at least need to have the control that I'm going to. And if possible, mm -hmm. also the next one. If not, I'm usually unfolding and folding the map again so I, didn't see, uh, so I can already pl plan the route to the next control. But other than that, you know, I just I just fold it however, as, as long as mm -hmm. it's comfortable and my compass gets close to the line, it's fine. Uh, all right, uh, the next one is a fun one. So favorite type of music and food? <laughs> um, like uh, favorite music, I think it's, uh, I'm listening a lot during the day, like when I'm working at the desk here, of course, um, I'm listening, um, that's a lot of uh, music. I can see a little bit my uh, Spotify uh, list there, and I can pick the the one. Uh... No, it's full of my kids' uh, favorites, so they click on it. So it's <laughs> uh... so I have a time to find. Uh... Yeah, no, I uh, I have a lot of uh, ACDC, so it's quite uh, old style. So yeah, I'm still uh, listening quite uh, quite much uh, old uh, hard work. Yeah, Good, and nothing food, wrong with that. Uh, food, I uh, really enjoy uh, cooking. So this uh, during my elite career, um, of course, you get sometimes um, resting and things like this. So I was uh, spending a lot of time uh, cooking in between uh, trainings. So um, I um, one of my uh, favorite it's uh, poke bowl with uh, salmon. So this it's um, I have done it uh, quite many times. So this is my. Uh, Did uh, you say po poke bowl like from poke bowl, Pokemons? Yeah. From Pokemon? No, no poke bowl. <laughs> so it's a mix of Hawaii uh, stuff with. Um, different uh, ta taste, uh, lime, and um, different stuff, yeah. So this okay. is a signature uh, plate. <laughs> All right, Qu quite uh, quite unique, I would say. Awesome. Uh, did you go to the gym when you were training professionally? It's um, It depends what you mean uh, by gym. Of course, uh, as I said, um, I did uh, quite much uh, alternative trainings. Uh, weighting uh, lift little bit i was doing of course a lot of core uh, training i think it's important to have a good balance and good uh, core strength um, so i was uh, mostly doing um, some uh, circuit uh, with not so much weight at some point i did some weight uh, trainings but I find it, of course, um, it has been a lot of uh, publication of, of about the benefit you can get uh, from this. So I did it for a couple of years, but also 
I don't know if I was aging or um, at the end, like I had quite uh, some challenge also with my back. So I was trying to avoid uh, lifting uh, too heavy weight. Mm -hmm. So um, I did some gym, but uh, not uh, on a very regular basis for many years. I was doing mostly um, appeals intervals to to get some strength or things like this. So um, it was not like a big, big routine. So I don't, um, I was not spending so much time at gym. Okay, cool. I, I also think it's not necessary. I mean, gen general core exercises are needed, but you don't need a gym to do it. I mean, even if you take uh, the calisthenic exercises uh, with your own body weight and uh, adjust them properly so that they target the proper muscles that you want to be strengthened, I think it's it should be definitely okay. And you, you, you can do really almost everything at home without any equipment. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And also... I I was a lot uh, on the road um, during my elite career. I mean, I was in camps uh, at least uh, two weeks per month, so I was not very often at home, and I never wanted to run after a gym when I was yeah. abroad, and sometimes I was at uh, very small places. So I was, uh, of course, doing. I had my uh, small uh, routines uh, in mornings. I was doing um, some kind of plank or a lot of uh, core exercise. I think it's important to to have a good balance in the terrains, to feel st strong in the trunk and uh, this kind of stuff. But I I feel it's uh, very possible to to be a top elite orienteer without being at gym uh, twice per week. So it's and uh, lifting uh, every every weight. So it's very individual. Like you you react to this, but very important to if you decide to lift weight. You need to do it with some professional. Yes, so it it can uh, be it it, it can, can be prone to injuries, right? Yeah, yeah, you can destruct a lot more than uh, build up. Sure. All right. Uh, the next one is really tricky, and I don't know the answer to this one. Uh, how to spot an orienteering talent at an early age? Very interesting question. I've been wondering about it, and mm -hmm. I think it's it's a tough one. Yeah, no, especially like um, I would say uh, there are different ways to develop. Some uh, can have a quite late uh, development. And uh, so I would say like you need to be quite uh, patient with this. And uh, basically, I believe like everyone can become a top elite orienteers if you invest enough time at some point and have the dedication. So I don't feel um, it's uh, very interesting to to pick strong profile uh, very early because, uh, but um, I would say just uh, to be enthusiastic about what you, you are doing, it's the most important. Like if you feel like uh, that kid is uh, really happy of, uh, being in forest or being with the map and uh, find it uh, fun. Of course, um, it's important to to make it fun for him or for her, like making a fun, tra fun training. I think it's, uh, I really believe in the power of the group. So it means as a coach, um, it's very important like to try to put uh, some kids together so they can have some kind of uh, fun uh, together. For, yeah. for me, as, as a start, it was the most important. Like I was going to the competition to play with my uh, my friends and I didn't uh, care about it. It could have been a tennis competition or anything else. Uh, it, sure. was same. it was just to, to meet after the race, to have a super nice time with them. So I feel like um, as a as a coach or as a leader, it's very important like to put some energy on uh, creating uh, group feelings and like making like relays, this kind of stuff so they can fit a little bit together and have fun, I think. And then uh, it's not before they are, uh, of course, uh, 17, 18, that you can really see, like, of course, if they have a physical talent or uh, they really enjoy uh, spending time and being focused, and it's different. But at uh, 10, 
I think um, it's sound. It's not early. It's too early, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, that's why I said I don't have a good answer to it. I mean, there are. I mean, I was thinking about it because there there are probably some tests you could um, make to try to pick someone who might have some predispositions. Uh, but uh, at the same time. I think that if what you said, right, if someone is not enjoying the sport, not having fun, not being passionate about it, uh, and will not fit into the group, well, you will lose probably the person anyway. So it, it doesn't really matter that much. But let's let's try to make it enjoyable for the youngsters. And mm -hmm. at an early uh, stage, we will get to um, pick from whatever is left, whoever is left, uh, people that uh, actually have the chance of aiming for the, for the top spots. All right, uh, the last one. And I think it's also a very good one. What are the benefits of night training? So we know the, that you've been doing uh, quite a lot of uh, <laughs> night training at some point of, the, of your career. Uh, from what I remember, I think it was because that the day training sessions were not challenging enough. I think I read it somewhere. Um, and it says over here that it's clearly harder and, and forces you to uh, be very strict with navigation process, but also route choice strategy must be different or safer and control setting is different than day orienteering, although during training sessions, you might avoid that. Um, um, and then uh, can, can that part be um, a disadvantage rather than an advantage for the training when it comes to night orienteering? Yeah, as long as there is uh, not uh, world championships in the... Um night orienteering it will uh, always be more or less of course there are those big relays uh, at night but uh, for me most of the time i was uh, running the last leg so it was at daytime so basically i was just do doing um, seeing uh, night orienteering as a tool to develop uh, my uh, technique i think like um, what you can compare of it's like night orienteering. It's very much, of course, it has changed a lot uh, over the last five years with those big headlamps. No, nowadays, it's um, almost uh, as close as uh, running uh, daytime. So yes. you can see during trainings, a lot of people are using the low bean and um, to get some kind of um, night uh, feelings. But Basically, it's uh, running on uh, daytime in a very dense terrain with low visibility. Exactly. So this yeah. uh, will um, help you a lot in green terrains. We have seen it at European Champs um, in Estonia last year when it was that green. It's really like night orienteering. You have the, the visibility for 5-10 meters, all the contours they fade away they are a little bit diffuse so you you need to trust the process you need to trust your compass and get really like this self-confidence that okay yeah i don't see the stuff but it will come and this at um, night training it's uh, always like this like um, you just uh, have part of the information so it's cut by the darkness. So, and you need to trust the process and believe like, okay, yeah, if I do this and this, I will get this result. So I would say like, uh, it's a big um, uh, confidence uh, boost to be able to perform at night. And um, also in Scandinavia, I mean, when you, you have the night uh, in winter at three or four o'clock, if you want to train twice per day, you, you need to do some uh, night orienteering. So maybe in Middle Europe, it's uh, not the same uh, stress. But at least in Scandinavia, you have at least uh, three, four months where um, if you don't use your headlamp, you don't uh, really train in the evening. Yeah. So for them, it has become some kind of um, habit. But I see it as a very good thing and also... At some point, for example, uh, it was in 2011 when uh, World Championships were in in Switzerland, uh, in France. So in those uh, casting terrains and also it's a little bit like this year, like um, a big part of the winter covered by the snow. I tried to find a tool to develop my technique because those uh, terrains were extremely difficult uh, technically. And it's something I had a hard time to reproduce 
during the winter because most of those uh, karstic terrains were under snow. So I decided to, most of the time, people run um, at night at uh, quite uh, easy speed. And that winter, I decided to have one uh, or two trainings per week at competition speed at night. Mm -hmm. And um, it was... Uh, very a very nice way to challenge uh, myself like in terms of control knowing when you need to push when you need to be more relaxed and um, i really enjoyed that winter and i could see i was developing technically in my um, uh, feelings for the navigation when i was taking too much risk when i was uh, still under control and it was um, very enjoyable so me of course i believe very much in um, in uh, night orienting to develop the technique it's uh, of course not all the terrains are super fun at night but i think in all the countries you can find some good terrains and uh, work a little bit on this so for me of course it's something i uh, recommend like uh, i did quite a lot yeah yeah cool i also will touch one more thing so the person asked you know what about setting the controls what about picking different route choices i think that if you're using it as a, it as a tool like you've mentioned and that so you're not training for the night competition but you're actually trying to develop some skills then you can set the controls just like you're setting them uh, during the day and also you may um, force yourself to pick the route choices that you would pick during the day races right and then you can focus or, or you can like uh simulate uh, as you said, uh, um, run the the more thick forest runability with less visibility, and it it as you said, it becomes a wonderful tool for training uh, some skills or preparing yourself for certain types of the of the terrains. Awesome! Uh, I think that's enough. I have my own questions, but uh, we will maybe leave them for for another time. Uh, thank you so much for joining the chat. It's been awesome and so much important, interesting uh, insight. Uh, from from the chat so it's been really truly amazing uh, um, and i hope you've enjoyed it as well yeah absolutely and um, i will be always uh, available i think it's uh, very important i really enjoy uh, talking about uh, with people outside uh, scandinavia i can see because, that <laughs> um, i think it's very important like um, we keep sharing the knowledge uh, yeah. to different countries and um, of course, I will always be available for this. Thank you. Thank you so much.